One of the uh, challenges of teaching chapter by chapter and verse by verse through the Bible is that you don't get to skip the uncomfortable ones. You don't get to skip the confusing ones. You don't get to skip the ones that are challenging or that make people in our culture say, well, I don't like that. We have to teach the text. We have to proclaim the truth of God's word. It seems to me that there has been a lot of opposition from the enemy of our souls this morning and this week in the preparation and preaching of this message. And so we're going to begin by asking God for his blessing on what is going to be proclaimed. Let's do that. Father, I thank you that your word has been given to us to be understood. It has been given to us to be obeyed. Father, it is not our responsibility to change your word, to make it more tasteful to a culture that has denied you. It is our responsibility, Father, to submit ourselves to the truth of Scripture, starting right here with me. And so I ask, Lord, that as I submit myself to you, your Holy Spirit would speak through me, through your word, to your people, that we would understand the truth of Scripture and be changed by what it teaches us. We thank you, we praise you, Father, for what you have planned. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of our message this morning is Designed by God. Already, we have entered the realm of controversy just with the title. Because I have on this title screen a picture of a man and a woman that were designed as a man and a woman by God. I have a bag here, and in this bag, I have some items. I have a can opener, and I have a cheese grater. Can opener and a cheese grater. I want to talk a little bit about these two items as we begin. First, let's talk about this cheese grater. This is a very nice cheese grater. It comes with two different sizes for you to grate cheese. It comes with this bowl that has a lid, right? You can put this on there, you can grate your cheese, and then you can put it right in the fridge. It's great. We have also up here a can opener. Can opener. This can opener has soft grip handles, I'm told by the description on Amazon. It has this easy turn handle. It has sharp blades to grip onto it. It even has a bottle opener. Okay, I've told you about the can opener. I've told you about the cheese grater. Now we have a really important question. Are you ready? Which one is better? We can't answer the question, can we? Because we don't know what we want to do. It depends, right? Are we opening a can? Then I'm probably going to want the can opener. Are we grating cheese? I'm going to want the cheese grater. The bottom line is that these two items have a very different role and function. It means it's not about which one is better. It's about the purpose for which it was created. And the reality is that there was someone who designed these, someone who invented them, and the designer made them on purpose to accomplish a specific task. And they are going to function best when they are used for that purpose in the accomplishment of the task. The same thing is true of you and me. We are men and women created by God, and we have been designed by him intentionally for a specific role and purpose. And we are going to function best when we live out that role and purpose. And I believe that it is this idea, the roles of men and women, that lies at the heart of our passage today. So, 
nothing difficult or controversial, right? Just a cultural nuclear bomb that we're about to drop, okay? So it's, it's nothing, not a big deal. I'm, I'm joking, right? Not like we haven't talked about anything controversial yet in 1 Corinthians. If you haven't noticed, the entire book of 1 Corinthians is a controversial book. Today we have a principle, and that is this. For the church to be healthy, we must fulfill our God-given roles. For the church to be healthy, we must fulfill our God-given roles. This principle comes with guidance. To fulfill our roles, we must ground ourselves on three truths. That's what we're going to look at this morning. And then the outcome is this. When, when we ground ourselves on these truths, it leads to that when the church is healthy, the church is effective. When the church is healthy, the church is effective. In our outline of the book of Corinthians, we reach a new spot, which is unity through a proper understanding of our roles. So three truths that we need to know to fulfill our God-given roles. Truth number one, our roles, our roles have a source. Our roles have a source. In my hometown where I grew up, Bernie, the tap water is amazing. It tastes great. We love going up there and getting some of that Bernie water uh, when we are there. Everyone drinks it. And the water is so amazing because it actually comes to your house from a natural spring, right? They pipe it in from the spring and you get spring water out of your tap up there. And it's good because it came from a good source, right? The source is natural spring water. So you open your tap, you get natural spring water. And what we need to understand in our roles as men and women is that they come from a good source, okay? They come from a good source. And so there's two ideas that help us grasp this source of our roles. Idea number one is that God prescribes. God prescribes. Chapter 11, verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Paul is still dealing with our freedom in Christ. That has been his topic since chapter 8. Here he's dealing with how our freedom in Christ applies to gender roles. So he's not answering a new question per se, but a new consideration in regards to our Christian liberty. Paul begins this section by saying, I praise you, brethren. Why is Paul praising them? Because he's been kind of saying a lot of really heavy things, and he's, he's lifting them up a little bit before he says some more heavy things, okay? Uh, correction needs to be mixed with praise. That's what Paul is doing. He's saying, I praise you. A little later in this same chapter, Paul's going to say, I do not praise you. So he's kind of lifting him up a little bit here. Why is Paul praising him? He gives two reasons. First, they remember him. Second, they keep the traditions. Paul just said in the previous verses, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he says, look, I praise you because you remember me in all things. You're doing well, right, in remembering me. They remember how he behaved and what he taught. And he says, but you also are keeping the traditions just as I delivered them to you. When Paul references the traditions, what he is referring to is the truths revealed in Scripture. At the time Paul wrote this, they did not have a completed New Testament like we have uh, for us today. And so what he's saying to them is, you've kept Scripture. You've kept the truth that I delivered to you. They want to keep these traditions. So they're best understood as the revealed truths that would later make up the canon of Scripture. What's interesting is they're keeping them just as Paul delivered them to them, he says. So they're not twisting them. They're not deviating from them. However, there are areas where their understanding is incomplete. And that is what Paul is writing to correct. And this reminds us of an important point. What we are to, about to study is not Paul's opinion. It is not, as some have claimed, a misogynistic dictate of an ancient culture, okay? This comes from God himself. This is the revealed word of God. Now look at verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. The Corinthians have done well. They have remembered what Paul taught them. 
However, there's something they need to know. Paul is correcting an error in their thinking. And without getting too far into the grammatical weeds, I want us to note that the understanding of the second two statements, right, that the head of every uh, woman is man and the head of Christ is God, those statements depend on our understanding of the first statement, okay? So it means we need to understand that the head of every man is Christ. What does that mean? And there is a lot of contention about this verse, and I think, uh, hopefully, we can clear the air a little bit this morning. The sense in which Christ is our head is the same sense in which the man is the head of his wife and the way God is the head of Christ. So the question becomes, what does it mean for Christ to be our head? To answer that, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. If you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's page 1347. Ephesians 5 Just a couple books to your right. Ephesians chapter 5, 25 to 30. This passage is famous because it is where Paul talks about marriage, but he also talks about Christ and the church and how these two things are pictures, right, of one another. 25, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, for he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church." For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. There is, of course, a sense in which Christ is our authority, but that is not all that Christ is. Men, to be the head of our wives, the head of our families, means sacrifice, just as Christ gave himself for us. But that's not all that Christ does. He nourishes, he cherishes, he protects. To be the head of a wife means to do those same things, to love unconditionally as Christ has loved us. Christ is our head, and we submit ourselves to him just as he submitted himself to the Father. When a man is walking in submission to Christ, he is then a fitting head for his wife. This is the order that God has ordained. Now, before you get bent out of shape, we have to understand that the headship of a husband is not about who is better. It's about role and function. It's not about which is better. They have a different design, a different role, a different function. To illustrate that, I want to quote from a pastor friend of mine. His name is Rick Gregory. And in teaching on this passage, he noted six truths relating to the equality of men and women. Here they are. First, women stand before God as equal to men being made in his image. Both men and women are made in the image and likeness of God. They are equal in that. Women are fellow heirs of the grace of life, not second-class citizens of God's kingdom. We see that in 1 Peter 3. Women are as fully gifted by the Holy Spirit and empowered by him to do God's will as men are. Women shared in the early church's struggle for the progress of the gospel We see that in Philippians 4, 1 through 3. And we'll continue in the same struggle in the church today. Women fulfill a vital part of the ministry in the work of building God's church. And finally, believers must hold every woman who serves her Lord Jesus Christ and his church in the highest regard. I mention those things because what happens is when we teach what Scripture says about headship and authority, people begin to go, Oh, they're saying that women are less than men. No. No, Scripture never teaches that. Men and women are equal. We're co-heirs with Christ. But we have a different role and function. And to illustrate that, Paul mentions that Christ has a head. God the Father is the head of Christ. Does that mean that Christ is less than God the Father? No. They're co-equal. Okay? So it's not about which is better or which is more important. It is about leadership. God the Father sent the Son. The Son and the Father send the Spirit, okay? And in the church, in the family, God has done the same thing. This is the truth 
about what God has done. Paul does not write this verse to give permission to treat women poorly or as second-class citizens. Paul wants the Corinthians to understand the truth. Men and women are equal in value. They're equal in their uh, in Christianity. They're equal under Christ, right? But they're different in role and function. Every relationship has distinct roles and functions. It's part of creation. It's part of the Godhead. So when we step back and we look at the big picture, this is what we see. God has designed men and women to function together in specific roles as equals. God des- God's design is for men to lead as Christ leads with loving, gracious service. Here's the idea. If I were to use this cheese grater to grate cheese and this can opener to open a can, I could mix the ingredients together and create a meal. If I'm using these as God has designed. Men and women, God has designed us differently. And when we function as God has designed us, something wonderful is produced. But that wonderful thing can't happen if we reject the role that God has given us. And that's what Paul is talking about here. This is the principle. We have been designed by God as men and women, as husbands and wives, to function in specific roles. And so our lesson is this. I have a God-given role and function. Would you read that with me, please? I have a God-given role and function. This is what God has prescribed. He has designed us and given us a role and function. Christ is the head of man, man the head of woman, God the head of Christ. This idea of headship sets up Paul's specific argument For the next few verses, our roles have a source. That source is God himself. So God prescribes. The second idea here is that culture expresses. Culture expresses. So in these next few verses, we kind of have a back and forth between a physical head and a spiritual head. And we'll explain that as we go. Verse 4, and that doesn't look right because I'm not in the right passage. There we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. When the physical head of a man is covered, right, and he prays and prophesies, he dishonors his spiritual head. According to verse 3, his spiritual head is Christ. Why is this an issue? Why does Paul even bring it up? Because of his culture. See, in their culture, women were to cover their heads and men were not. So if a man were to cover his head, it would be the equivalent of him saying, I want to be a woman. And Paul says, you're not to do that. Okay? So the issue isn't about the head covering at all. The issue is about men need to look like men and women need to look like women. Why? Because that is how God designed you. And that is how you are to function. The issue is that when men are praying, right, they're speaking to God, that's what we do in prayer, or when they're prophesying, they're speaking to men about God, they need to look like men. That's what he's saying. They need to demonstrate their submission to Christ by submitting to their God-given role as men. The interesting thing here is that the Christian practice is actually in contrast to the Jewish custom. Because in the Jewish custom, both the men and women wore something on their head, the women's was just something different. Okay, so that they could differentiate between the two. The Christians formed a new custom. And that was when they were in a church setting, the men were to have their heads uncovered. Now look at verse 5. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. To uncover for the woman was like having a shaved head. Now, Why was that a big deal? Because in that culture, shaving your head was one of the signs that you were a prostitute. And so these women were coming into the church and they were saying, well, I have freedom in Christ. I can uncover my head. And what they were, the signal they were sending is, well, in Christ, we're prostitutes. And Paul says, that's not helpful to the culture. Hopefully we can all understand why that's an issue, right? To, in that culture, Looking as it, declaring to everyone, I'm a prostitute. That's what they were saying. And Paul says, this is a problem. He says it dishonors her head. It specifically dishonors the woman's husband or father because they have a God-given responsibility to protect and provide for her. 
Not because she's weak, not because she can't do it herself, but because that is the role and the function that God has given and that God has determined. And so to help us understand, we need to know what was going on in Corinth. See, Corinth, they were caught in what I call the pendulum effect. And here's what happens. We're over here and we learn a new exciting truth of scripture and we go, Whee! and all of a sudden we're over here, right? Where, where we need to be is balanced. And so the Corinthians were over here and they heard, we have freedom in Christ. Whee! And what did they do, right? In the last chapters, we saw them eating meat in an idol's temple because they're like, we have freedom in Christ. Well, that was one of the things they did. The other thing they did is the men and women were like, well, we're one in Christ, right? There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer male nor female. So we can throw off these gender roles and we can be whatever we want. Men can look like women. Women can look like men. It's, it's all free in Christ. And Paul goes, no. <laughs> You're taking your freedom a little bit too far. Because men and women are one in Christ and co-heirs with Christ, because we're equal in the blood of Jesus, some of them swung this pendulum. And Paul says we need to bring it back into balance. And so he says that the women need to have a head covering, but he specifically says when they're praying or prophesying. So he's not talking about wearing a head covering 24-7. He's specifically talking about in a church setting. And as a kind of a side note, women were expected to participate in the church service. They were expected to pray and prophesy in the church service. Now, prophesy here is different than, than preach, okay? Um, we're not going to open that can of worms too far today, but needless to say, we can, and we have in the past. There's lessons on that in the, on our website. And if you want to know more about that, you can come and talk to me. So they could have leadership roles in churches, uh, just not authoritative roles, um, for example, an elder. Now, look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. Now, this is obviously cultural, right? Because what they're saying is, in that culture, it was shameful for a woman to have short hair or to be shaved. But that's not the case in our culture, okay? So the culture was, was dictating some of these rules. In Paul's day, a woman covering her head indicated she was married, she was identifying herself as a woman, and she was taking her place in the role that God had given her. That's what it indicated, okay? It was a big deal. All of these things were indicated just by the head covering. That's why it was an issue. However, the issue is not about the covering. The issue is about submission to Christ and the role that he has given. And by taking the head covering off, they were indicating, I don't care what Christ has said. I want to do what I want. So it was about the heart. The head covering was a physical, visible illustration of what was going on in the heart. Okay? So, we got to take the question head on. Should women be wearing head coverings today? No. There you go, we'll move on. No, I'm just kidding. Why not? Why not? Because we, first of all, just from a practical standpoint, does Paul tell you what the head covering was? No. It could have been a veil. It could have been something on their head. It could have been a little doily. It could have been a number of things. We don't know. So if we were to try to wear a head covering, we would just be symbolic because we don't even know what they wore. Okay? So, but also, it's not, because that is not how submission to Christ and God-given roles is signified in our culture, okay? We don't wear head coverings to show that you're a woman today, right? We have other ways of doing that. God prescribes roles for men and women. We're designed by God with different roles and functions, and some of the expression of those roles are derived from culture. Paul says this because that was their culture, He's saying you need to look like men, you need to look like women in the culture in which we are in. To be clear, our roles as men and women are given by God. And some of the expression of those roles can be determined by the culture. And this is where it becomes a Christian liberty issue. Do we have freedom in Christ, right? Did the, did the Corinthians have freedom in Christ to not wear the head coverings? Absolutely. But Paul says that would not be a good testimony in that culture. So, our lesson is this. I represent Christ to the culture. Would you read that with me, please? I represent Christ to the culture. We need to represent him well. 
If we're going to fulfill our God-given roles, we need to know these three truths. One, our roles have a source. That source is God. Truth number two, our roles make us strong. Our roles make us strong. Have you ever used something for a purpose that it was not intended to be used for? Well, remember our cheese grater and our can opener? We're going to do a little experiment. Because what our culture tells us is that eh, roles don't really matter, right? It's, it's not that big of a deal. So we're going to grate this cheese with a can opener, right? Because it doesn't really matter, right? This is not going so well. Maybe if I turn the handle. Right? Yeah, the bottle opener. Well, you know what? You know what? We'll set that aside for a second here. Um, and let's see. Maybe we can open this can with our cheese grater. Right? That'll work better. Hmm. It's almost like the design of these matters. That didn't work so well, did it? Why not? Because we're not using the tools the way they were designed to be used. We have a designer. And he has created us as tools for his purpose and glory. And when we are used as he has designed, we find joy and fulfillment and effective ministry. But when we go outside of his design, we make a mess, like I did of the cheese. We get hurt and we are ultimately ineffective for ministry. So when we function within our God-given roles, we are strong. And that strength comes from two places. Number one, strength comes from purpose. Strength comes from purpose. We have a purpose. We represent Christ. As husbands and wives, we're a picture of Christ and the church. And to represent Christ well, we live a certain way. Look at verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. I want to remind us all, all of us, that this is a very difficult passage. This is culturally charged. And when we read some of what Paul writes through our 21st century understanding, we can misunderstand. And I don't want to do that this morning, so I want to be as clear as I can be, and if I'm not as clear as I can be, come talk to me later, please, and we'll clarify. Here's Paul's argument. God created humankind, male and female, in his image. He did this for his purpose and glory. However, the man and the woman were not created at the same time. The man was created with dominion and given the task of naming the animals along with the tending of the Garden of Eden. And it was after the man had named the animals that the woman was created to help him with his God-given task. Both men and women are in the image of God. And this is the sense in which man was created as God's steward, his representative, with authority over creation. And in this, he brings God glory. The woman was created in the image of God to bring him glory, but also to help the man accomplish his God-given task. And in this, she brings glory to the man. So we're not saying women are less than men. We're saying that they have different roles and functions, okay? So before we stomp all over this passage with our 21st century ideas, Paul explains why this is true in verses 8 and 9. For, this is because, man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor is man created for the woman, but woman for the man. So he's explaining, what, how is woman the glory of man? This is his argument, and it's rooted in creation. He says, man is not from woman, but woman from man. Rooting his argument in creation tells us that this is a design issue. God designed things this way. He has a purpose for our roles. Again, this is like the cheese grater and the can opener. It's not about one being better than the other. It's about having a different role and function. So Paul says, in the Genesis account of creation, a rib was taken from Adam, and from that God formed man. She was taken out of man. That's what the word woman means. That's verse 8, right? Man did not come from the woman, woman came from the man. But verse 9 is another affirmation of the Genesis account where God said that it was not good for man to be alone. And so he made a helper suitable for him, he made Eve. God gave the man a responsibility, 
He gave the man a helper in that responsibility. It's not about who is better. It's about God's design. He is not in any way suggesting that the woman is less than or inferior to the man. Paul's point is that our role and function as men and women does not come from culture, but from God himself. Kevin DeYoung writes this. He says, thus, we have two spiritually equal creatures, man and woman, with two different but complementary roles. The woman is the helper and support of the man, while the man is the head of the woman. The roles are not status symbols or value markers. They are simply different roles. Look at verse 10. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Just when we think, ah, oh, we're getting into safer waters, he throws in this just for fun. For this reason... Because of God's design, because of God's creation order, because of the roles and responsibilities that God has given, a woman should wear a head covering because of the angels. What? <laughs> what does that mean? Angels are beings, they are messengers of God, created for his glory and purpose. And Lucifer, the chief angel, rejected his God-given role and attempted to usurp God's throne and became who we know now as Satan or the devil. With this background in mind, it is clear that angels care about beings functioning in their God-given roles. Why? Because they know the consequences of rejecting that. They saw that in Lucifer. So what Paul's telling us is that angels participate in church worship services. And they watch to see if we are functioning in the roles that God has given to us. From the very beginning, God has this purpose for men and, issue, and women. And all of this highlights the real issue. The real issue here is not about head coverings. It's about submission to God and fulfilling the role he has assigned us. When we function in the role he has given, we have strength and purpose. And so the lesson here is this. I was created by God with purpose. I was created by God with purpose. Would you read that with me and fill in the purpose part? I was created by God with purpose. Amen. So the strength of our roles comes from purpose. Secondly, strength comes from dependence. Strength comes from from dependence. This is the point at which some start to get heated, right? Paul, how dare you? What are you doing? Paul, how dare you talk this way about men and women? But what he says next was just as scandalous in his culture. Look at verse 11. He says, nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. <gasps> See, in our culture, we're like, okay. Yeah. In Paul's culture, that was a scandalous statement to make. He's saying we're interdependent. This is according to God's design. We mentioned this earlier, but look at Genesis 2.18. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. When we read the creation account, this verse hits like an avalanche because after each day we read, And God said that it was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. It is not good. And it's like, whoa, something's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. God created us for one another. He created us in marriage to be a picture of Christ and the church. And when we reject our God-given roles, we destroy that picture. There is a key phrase here, and that is in the Lord. And I love this. Because the only place in which a proper understanding of our roles as men and women is found is in the Lord. There's no fulfillment outside the bounds of Christ. If the church, the body of Christ, is to be healthy, it must have both men and women fulfilling their God-given roles. And that includes roles and functions in the church. The church needs godly women using their gifts for the glory of Christ. Okay? The church needs godly men using their gifts for the glory of Jesus Christ. When we're not fulfilling our function, we're not effective for Christ. So Paul says we're inter interdependent. Look at verse 12. He explains why we're interdependent. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. This again, he goes back to creation. The woman was formed from man's rib, so she came from man. But man is born through woman, right? As all of us are. So we're interdependent. We need one another. It's the only way we get into this world, through childbirth, okay? At the end of the verse, Paul reminds us of a powerful truth. All things are 
from God. This is a reminder that the roles given to us came from God himself, like the cheese grater and the can opener. God has designed us to function in specific roles. Woman came from man, man from woman, all from God. We cannot exist apart from one another. When we depend on one another, as God has designed, we are strong. Strength is not found in the ability to stand alone. Strength is found when we depend on one another and find that there is always help in the body of Christ. In Ecclesiastes, it says a threefold cord is not easily broken. And so the lesson is, I was created by God for fellowship. I was created by God for fellowship. Read that with me, please. I was created by God for fellowship. We need one another. God's design is not for men to lord over women. It is, his design is for us to function together. Where I am weak, Jess is strong, and vice versa. We complete one another, and together we can accomplish more for Christ than we could apart. And as we do that, as we function in our roles, Christ is glorified, and we find our greatest fulfillment and usefulness. We are effective in ministry as we function together. Three truths we must know to fulfill our God-given roles. Number one, our roles have a source. It is God. Number two, our roles make us strong. We are interdependent. Number three, our roles can be understood. Our roles can be understood. One of the arguments that has been made against a biblical understanding of gender roles is that things are so much more complicated today. Uh, this is not true. Anyone making that claim doesn't understand the culture of Paul's day. Things were just as complicated back then. It is possible to understand God's plan for men and women. So one more time, we'll look at this can opener and cheese grater. Did you know that these come with user guides or instruction manuals? They do. So if you are unsure or uncertain how you use this, uh, if you're uncertain if you should use it on a block of cheese, you can go to the user manual. If you're uncertain if you should try to open a can with your cheese grater, it has a guide. Hopefully you know where I'm going with this. We have a user manual. We have a guide that lays out our proper role and function. And if we want to be fulfilled and happy and joyful, we function as God has designed so to understand our roles, we take three actions. Action number one, we need to discern. We need to discern. Look at verse 13. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? This word judge means to evaluate, and it seems to be a call to observe the culture around us. We're to examine the culture and nature itself to help us with this issue. So he says, judge among yourselves. It is, pro is it proper? Proper is fitting or appropriate. To my understanding, this anchors the idea firmly in the culture. Why do I say that? Because God is not primarily concerned with the external, right? Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart, heart. So, 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. What we're being told in this verse is to look around us and determine what a person who is a follower of Christ should do in our context. How should a follower of Christ behave? How should we dress? How should we carry ourselves? That's what is in view. I say that because God doesn't care necessarily about what you're wearing. Okay? He cares about your heart. And so the head covering isn't the issue because it's an external thing. What God's worried about is the heart that is expressed in the head covering. When our hearts are right, our behavior reflects submission to Christ. So to understand our roles, we need this discernment. And the lesson is this. To behave properly, I must be discerning. Would you read that with me, please? To behave properly, I must be discerning. I cannot function in the role God has given if I'm not aware of what's going on around me. So if we're going to understand our roles, we need to discern. Secondly, we need to observe. Look at verses 14. Uh, verse, verse 14 first. Verse 14, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? 
one of the things that we are to evaluate is what nature reveals. Now, I do not believe that Paul's point here is about long hair in particular, and here's why. Paul says that long hair is a dishonor for a man. However, nature doesn't teach us that, and neither does Scripture. What do I mean? Samson was commanded by God to have long hair. So either Samson was being sinful, or this means something else, right? There's something else in view here. What Paul's saying is you look at your culture, look at nature around you, What's, what are, what's the, how does one determine who is a male and who is a female? Because that's the underlying point. Men need to look like men. Women need to look like women. There ought to be outward evidence of someone's gender. That is what I believe Paul is saying. What nature teaches us is that there ought to be a clear distinction between the sexes. What is interesting is that a distinction between the sexes is often culturally determined. And in Paul's day, it was head coverings. Today, not so much, right? We need to re be reminded that there's a bigger point here, and that is of submission. The head covering was an outward manifestation of an inward submission to Christ. And we need to look like male and female because that is what God has designed us to be. Nature reveals this truth, and we see that in verse 15. Verse 15, but if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Covering uh, here is a different word than above. Some have taught that the woman's hair is her covering. Um, that's grammatically impossible, according to the passage, because it's a different covering. It's a different word. So he's not saying that her hair is given to her as a covering so you don't have to wear something on your head. What he's saying is your hair is given to you as this covering to reveal femininity or masculinity, right? That's this idea. Again, it's a cultural point. Men should look like men. Women should look like women. That is what I, the point I believe Paul is making. Thomas Constable puts it this way. He says, this is a very general observation. The fact that some acceptable men's hairstyles are longer than some women's does not mean that these styles are perversions of the natural order. Men are usually taller than women, but this does not mean that a short man or a tall woman is dishonorable, right? In, in our culture today, as some women's hairstyles are shorter. Is that wrong? No. Because our culture has other ways of differentiating between the sexes. Here's the point. God made you a man or he made you a woman. That was not a mistake. It was not an accident. You were intentionally designed by God and given a role and purpose. And our responsibility is to submit ourselves to what God has done. So be a man and be a woman and be satisfied and content with what God has made you. We observe nature and it reveals that men are to be men and women are to be women. So the lesson is that my gender was given to me by God for his purpose and glory. Would you read that with me, please? My gender was given to me by God for his purpose and glory. We're going to be fulfilled, content, and useful as we submit to God's design. So to understand our roles, we take three actions. We need to discern. We need to observe. Finally, we need to submit. We need to submit. Verse 16. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. The uh, NASB is actually a little bit more clear here. Um, and the NASB says, but if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. Paul is anticipating something. He's anticipating that he's going to present this truth and someone's going to go, oh, no, no, Paul, that's not okay. And he goes, look, this is the only practice we have. There's no other custom. So deal with it, is what he's saying in this verse. Okay? Uh, he says they're going to be contentious. This is a fun Greek word. Uh, this is the Greek word phylonikios. And it means contentious, inclined, or showing an inclination to dispute or disagree. Paul has laid down some hard truths. And he knows there's going to be pushback. So to combat that, he points out that all the churches do this. He says, look, Corinthians, this is what he's saying. Corinthians, you are the ones who are out of line. <laughs> Everyone else has said, okay, we'll do that. You're the ones who aren't saying that. He's saying they need to submit to themsel themselves to what God has revealed. We will never understand our roles as men and women if we are fighting against them. That's what Paul's saying. So, lesson. When I submit to Christ, I am set free to embrace his role for me. Read that with me, please. When I submit to Christ, I am set free to embrace his role for me. 
God made you and me exactly who he wanted us to be. He does not make mistakes. So this is how we wrap this up. The big picture is of design and purpose. God designed us to function according to specific roles and for specific purposes. If God made you a male, he did so intentionally. And being a male comes with responsibilities and expectations. If God made you a female, he did so intentionally. And being a female comes with certain responsibilities and expectations. Men and women are equal before God. So I want us all to make the same commitment, and that is this. It's in their backwards. Anyway, okay, so men and women are equal before, before God, equal in dignity and worth, but different in role and function. We're equal before God, but we have a different role and function. What this means is that our lives need to submit ourselves to Christ and embrace the role he has given. This goes for every area, our personal, our friendships, our parenting, our marriage. So the commitment I want all of us to make is this. I will submit to Christ and serve him in the role that he has given me. If you are willing to make that commitment, read it with me. I will submit to Christ and serve him in the role that he has given me. So, four things as we wrap this up. First, God is the source of all gender roles. It comes from God. We need to submit to him. Secondly, when we function according to his design, we are strong. Third, God's purpose and design for our lives is good. God did not make you a male or female to ruin your life. Okay? He did it on purpose. He designed you intentionally. And so, submission to Christ is the only way to be spiritually healthy and effective. Submission to Christ is the only way to be spiritually healthy and effective. Hopefully that is clear as mud. If you have any questions, never hesitate to contact me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that your word does not shy away from the difficult things, the hard things. And Lord, I pray that we would submit ourselves to Christ, embrace the role that you have given us, and serve you with our whole heart, with full devotion to you. I pray, Lord, that we, as Grace Church of Lockford, as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would be an example to follow in how we submit to Christ, how we submit to one another, and how we function in the roles that God has given us. I ask, Lord, your blessing on each one who is here. I ask that this week, everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think would bring praise and honor and glory to you and your name. I ask that you'd give us safety as we go home. In Jesus' name, amen.